Hi, this is Zoe Routh, and I absolutely love to work with CEOs and their teams on the tough stuff in leadership, the people stuff. It's also the fun stuff, but sometimes we forget that when we're confronted with the tough stuff. And imagine this, you walk into a room and there is a group of people sitting there with their arms crossed, entrenched resistance due to long-standing negative experiences from people just like you in leadership positions. How do you handle this? How do you break down that distrust and start to engage people? Well, my guest today, she is an expert at this. She has learned how to develop rapport and relationships in the toughest of circumstances. Her name is Edwina Hayes. She is the CEO at Regional Development Australia in the Murray region. She has started off her world as a farmer. She is a business owner. And her career initially started off as a social worker, and she spent a few years working at Holbrook Landcare Network. So she has a lot of experience of dealing with people in many different areas, and she's got some wonderful insights about how to lead effectively in diverse groups and how to build that intensive rapport. So let's get into it. And if you really enjoy this discussion and this interview, like I did, it was such an amazing conversation. Please share this episode with somebody that you value and trust and appreciate. It helps get the word out. I really value it and appreciate it myself. Okay, let's do it. Edwin, it's so wonderful to have you on the call and uh, I hope you're enjoying this winter that we're having. Oh, well, it's nice to have some cooler weather and see the autumn, uh, you know, the autumn colours come in, but I'm not sure. I uh, I have just had some bad news about our home heater. So being at home with COVID, the uh, heater has uh, kicked the bucket and we're waiting for news about how to replace it. So I'm a little anxious about that at the moment. Yeah, that's not a good thing. <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> I, these houses in Australia are cold enough as it is without having heating. So tell me, where are you actually located, just for our listeners' sake? So, Zoe, I'm in Albury, which is southern New South Wales on the Victorian border. We actually live on a little farm, but um, for this Regional Development Australia job, I've had to move into town so that the kids can uh, catch the school bus so that the kids can get to school because in the country, in New South Wales, we just couldn't get the bus and work full-time in town, so currently living in the northern suburbs of Albury, Thaguna. Do you get back out to your farm as well? Yeah, all the time. So my husband still runs, uh, we've got a couple of businesses and he, so he's out there most days and runs a fencing contracting business from there. So yeah, we've got a compound, we're leasing out the house, but have a compound out the back that we use for the businesses and yeah, we certainly with COVID, we've been taking the kids out there on the weekends to blow off steam and, you know, bust sheep, run around behind sheep and, uh, you know, get muddy. Yeah. You say businesses, and this is one of the things that strikes me about rural and regional folk is that you're so resourceful. So how many businesses do you guys actually have? So we have, we run a little farm and uh, we tend to run that as a, um, circular economy you know we don't do it perfectly but we try and then we have uh, NIP rural services which is a fencing rural fencing contracting business and we have stable erections which is a specialist labor for the for big events and shows like uh, Sydney Royal Melbourne Royal Equitana in the past we've done Canberra Royal and equestrian trials and things here in uh, Albury so providing specialist labour to put up and pull down stables. Wow. What does that mean to run a farm with a circular economy? Uh, it, so, <laughs> of course, within the legal guidelines of how you can buy and sell produce, <laughs> we, we, do, we have a barter system amongst uh, a wide group of people in our community and, and friends, so in our local community and friends, where we exchange the different meats that we produce so and sometimes we one person will grow the uh, product and as a group of families will get together and uh, do the slaughter and, and butchering and everybody takes home their share of the product or we trade depending on what we've got in freezers and things at the time so obviously we don't have it at the moment but we've got a bit you know very large veggie patch which means we were about 80 percent self-sufficient so the circular economy being that uh, we use all the 
animal byproducts. So we run a lot of different types of livestock so that chicken manure, horse manure, sheep manure, cattle manure can be used and mixed to make uh, fertiliser. And, you know, when we feed hay and things like that, it's used in a particular way to um, replenish the soil, help the soil be, to regenerate. So we use regenerative ag principles as far as possible and bartering and swapping and sharing to you know, keep the exchanges uh, all related to the farm. That's really cool. So it, there's no money in exchange in that system? No. And although there's no waste relocated elsewhere the waste is reinvested in the land and so on is that the captures the idea of a circular economy in the farm context yeah so there's some product that goes out the farm gate and we try to replace that by bringing in materials that contribute so we try to keep it as organic as possible but you know that's not necessary so sometimes we'll bring we'll spray weeds that don't respond well in our country to organic principles um, or it's, you know, too slow over time, that sort of thing. But generally it's, yeah, what comes in is uh, fodder. So we bring, you know, that brings carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus onto the property and uh, the sheep and cattle eat it and it comes into our system, yeah. So what's the overarching objective of this? Is it to maintain, keep things local? Is it so that you reduce pressures on the global uh, climate system or is it... What is the like the actual higher motivation? <laughs> I, I think I wish that I had those higher motivations and I'd like to think that I do sometimes. Particularly, I mean, I uh, people who know me will be aware I worked in land care for, for 10 years and I learnt so much from, um, you know, in that community and I'm still a big part of that community. I can't, you know, I'd like to be able to say that, but I think ultimately I just followed my nose with what I learned growing up. How you should do things is, you know, with the using the least resources you can for the best outcomes. And I think when I had kids particularly, I really wanted to, I was just compelled, I think, like naturally as a mother to pass some of those uh, knowledge and skills on that you learn by doing, not by watching or reading or seeing. And yeah, so although I'd like to think I have some higher goals around, you know, our footprint, yeah, I think ultimately it's far more it meets my needs around nurturing and um, raising raising animals and um, plants and things is you know very rewarding for me and something that I really we we not I we my husband and I really wanted to uh, the kids to understand how to do it not just how to do it but what, you know how rewarding it is putting in the effort and being patient and uh, yeah all the traits I guess that come from practicing that as a part of a family. That's very cool. So you've led a number of family businesses, you're leading a family, you're, you've led a number of different organizations. How do you define leadership? I, I, when I saw that question, Zoe, I, th you know, I think I'd start by saying, I, I always feel like it's co-leadership. <laughs> I, I know that I don't feel like I'm the leader. You know, it's not an I principle for me. And I've had this conversation with so many people who ask about leadership. I just, it doesn't sit easily. So I'm a social worker and as a social worker, we have a code of practice and a way of being that is very, you know, for me is just completely embedded in the collective. And so when I think about our family and our farms, we run that together, my husband and I, when I think about uh, land care and groups and organisations and things like that, there have always been people that have brought the best out in me or um, done things together with me that mean that the whole has gotten better. Is there a role for a leader? And well, maybe it's why we have to define it. So I'm thinking a leader with the person with the title and authority. If leadership, as you define it, is about the collective, what then is the role of the person with authority and title? That's a great question because applying that in my businesses and my work, I often haven't been the person with the um, authority or the title. Uh, you know, my husband was a sole trader and then he's the sole director of our company, those sorts of things. So it's actually, I don't, you know, this is one of the first roles that I've had as a more mature practitioner that has director 
in the title and and has authority. And I think to that, our RDA Murray Regional Development Australia Murray is a tiny organisation with a really big ask. So for me, leadership in that sense is really about bringing the best out in others. So I'm really practicing that um, with our committee. So RDA Murray, I might be the person who um, is called the director, but I have a committee of people who are volunteering their time altruistically to give back to their community because they believe in regional development. And that engagement from them means that we're able to lead, we're able to role model and practice and behave in a way in our community that resonates and has a ripple effect um, amongst the wider network that we've created. I think when I look at other areas of leadership, I I tend to think about people who need to want to provide an opportunity to stretch for either themselves or a group of people around them. So you've got to have that um, will or desire to be doing something better and I really struggle with that because I as in for as an individual because I think everybody I I don't think I've ever met anyone who didn't want to get better you'd be surprised (laughs) (laughs) there's some people who are very happy just the way they are and don't want to shift at all (laughs) but in their hearts there might be something you know I I I think this is the social worker in me is that I would be able to conceptualize and focus on an element in that person where they did want to get better you know better at something better within themselves even if it's about wanting to feel more you know I think those people that you're talking about you know I've certainly come across people who resist a particular change or something like that but often that's because they're fearful or, you know, they'll, for me, there'll be an underlying reason that they still want to feel better within themselves that you can tap into to help them become more of what they want. So I think that's probably the crux of it is being with people and, and paying attention to what they want, not deciding what they should want. Oh, that's a huge insight. So say that again. So paying attention to what they want as opposed to what they should want yeah so leadership leaders I often see they'll say this is the way to good leadership or this is what good leadership is and I think well it depends who's with you who who you're doing something with how it's happening all those sorts of things and so for me well what works for me is high high connectedness so the more I feel connected the more I feel some sense of the other person's being and that they're present and they're wanting something then the more likely we are to do something really good together. How do you do that so how do you foster that connectedness? Well, so being a social worker, I go back to some really basic principles. Uh, You can imagine in this COVID environment, um, telephone calls really suck for me and emails are even worse. (laughs) So for me, it's those really basics of eye contact, a deep-seated value that every individual unique person has a value. So when I, you know, I hope that when I look in someone's eyes, what I see in them is their value and their worthiness and and how they are and hopefully what they see in me is someone who who reflects that and and that reflection is often that golden moment where you can say what is it we're going to do together that's going to going to be better for you that's going to help you get what you want and help me get what I want. So you've had a lot of experience with people stuff as a social worker and then now as heading up uh, the development authority which is run with committees Committees are a very different beast than working one-on-one with people. What has been the most challenging people stuff experience that you've had along your journey? Probably the, the, the most challenging stuff for me is working in highly conservative environments where there's not a lot of trust. So in terms of building collective understandings of issues and addressing collective desires to be doing something better. Uh, So most of my practice has been in groups, in community development, uh, in in social work terms. So casework, yes, I did casework for about 15 years as an infant, child and adolescent mental health therapist. But I also did group work and community development and advocacy, which is sort of where my career has evolved to, that community development and advocacy 
really how I see meeting those needs that people are, are you know, projecting forward. So when individuals are feeling threatened and their, their focus has become on something that um, is negative and a defended position, I think that's probably the, you know, the, the times when I find it toughest, when, when people have their armour up and they're, you know, sometimes people are angry, sometimes they're sad, you know, it, it's been in any number of circumstances that i come across that. But yeah, I guess when people are wounded and hurt and they're, you know, they want something, so they're there <laughs> physically, but there's a lot of barriers emotionally and psychologically um, and cognitively for them to um, take that next step towards what they're identifying they want. That in that space, oh, you know, and that's where that you know, I believe in the value of that person. You know, I know that they're there. They've got their resources there. They want something. I know that we'll be able to find a way there because they're there. If they didn't want to, they wouldn't be there. You know, they've already voted with their feet and said, this is something I want to do. And so working out how to do that, I think ultimately is really simple one step after the other of, you know, okay, so let's explore why you're here. What What is it about? whatever their aim is that is going well, what's not going well, and really, you know, I think that very common practice of breaking it down into steps that people can achieve. And by doing that, every time you take a little step or break something down, your connection with that person gets stronger. You know, our understanding of each other would get stronger. And in a group setting, I guess those, and this might be a, a trick in the in terms of, uh, you know, a trick for me about what leadership is compared to co-leadership is that as individuals in a group setting start to make higher connections with you rather than the group status of, you know, fear or stuck if, if people are stuck, but that group status, once they start to connect with the the new status that they want, then that brings people forward and you create a, a groundswell, I guess, of movement that other people will join. So collective will is something that I think really is so powerful. And if you can tap into that and help other people tap into that, we can make movement you know, at a transformational scale rather than movement for, you know, one individual after another, after another, after another, which is pretty heartbreaking in a large community. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just time consuming too. Mm. Uh, so tell me, I just want to understand this a little bit more. So when you're working with someone and you're trying to figure out what it is that they're in the room for, what they're committed to and trying to get them to inch forward to come on board and to drop their, drop their distrust a little bit, what is the status piece that you're referring to? You mean what status ambitions they have within the group or status for their ambitions more broadly? What do you mean by that? Uh, I, th- I think I just refer to group status. So the okay. status quo in the group, like whatever the is the common understanding of what's stopping. So a really good example in our region is water policy and people's experiences of, you know, their own personal experiences of water allocations against licences and what that means. We have uh, a very polarised community. I, I think things have really gotten better in the last you know, year or so, but there are elements of the community that are still really polarised. And when, when that's happening, it's, you know, this is an example that if um, in a group of people who have experienced a collective uh, feeling and sense of being let down repeatedly, of not being listened to, that sort of thing, I think that, for example, the first step in in that would be, well, what 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 is it that's happened? And just by talking and listening, you're actually demonstrating that you're doing something different to that status quo of we're not listened to. Okay. And that breaks, you know, that breaks down the first little barrier to developing trust. So I would never expect anybody to drop their trust without a good reason. So you got to work for it. And by working for it, I mean picking those elements that you know that you in the moment can do something that challenges it. And if it is in this instance being listened to, being actively listening to someone, having eye contact, paraphrasing back to them, you know, that's what I meant by those simple skills. I think we often overlook them when we get into high strategic objectives, but actually doing those and practicing those in in the moment is what can help people move from a defended position to a more open mindset and being able to see what strategic objectives are out there and then make, you know, more informed and less 
less close, it's hard to say, you know, they're not op- more open decisions because they, they, you know, people have come to these conclusions because of their experiences. But I think getting people to have a different experience collectively means they feel more confident to think about it differently and, um, and move on. What's the biggest breakthrough that you've experienced in this role? Uh, biggest breakthrough? Um, <laughs> It's a bit, this is a bit corny <laughs> and very small, but uh, with my committee, we actually, we changed the way the director's reports were written. So I just, you know, I inherited a kind of process where I wrote a director's report that was very um, official and officious, I would say. And the committee just really weren't engaging with it. And after about a year, one of the committee members said, hey, I, I just... I'd rather something different from you. Like, you you know, when you talk about it, I get it. But when I read it in the report, it just, you know, yeah, right, done. And so we changed the report, not hugely, but just, you know, tweaked the report and the the connection with the committee. It was like a light bulb went on for everybody about what I was talking about and how that was connected to the KPIs and what they'd asked me to do rather than, yeah, trying to marry up, I think, way too many masters, you know, way too many different KPI, we've got KPIs and outcomes and objectives, you know, all that sort of stuff. Trying to put that into a report was just a bit overwhelming and we broke it down to a dashboard style, you know, colour coded <laughs> basics. And yeah, the, the connection with the committee really changed. So um, yeah, that would be one of them. I love how you think that's corny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it was a really small thing that, you know, so I'm going, oh, breakthrough moment. Uh, you know, there are others, like when people go, oh, you run a business or, you know, or they realise something about you. It's not so much in my role, but I recently, in my Twitter um, groups, I noticed that a lot of our our farmer advocates were sharing these me at 20 photos. And, you know, I've known most of these people as 50 plus year olds and, you know, I've only met them in the last 10 years and they, and so they've been 50, 60 years old and they're sharing these photos at 20 and I went, wow, they became people, you know. For what, me. When they're, they became people at 50 or? <laughs> no, for me, like they weren't just this, per, this Twitter handle advocate person that I know quite well because we've been communicating for a year or so social media uh, you have this relationship that has all these rules and parameters around it people were sharing these personal photos of them at 20 and I went oh of course they grew up on farms too or or wherever you know or they didn't or you know and they became a, a whole person for me rather than I think I'd become a little complacent and, you know, on social media, it's just really easy to connect with people at a superficial level, at a, say, an academic level, or we're sharing, this is the reason we do this, rather than that more deep and personal connection that's going to create magic. And, yeah, I'll dob him in. Uh, Jeremy Morton is this amazing um, water and rice grower advocate from Western Murray Valley and yeah he shared a a me at 20 and I just just I went oh my god (laughs) wow (laughs) of course (laughs) that's who you are or you know it just made me realize that and uh, as a result I shared a picture of me at 20 and it's just insane I can't believe you know 290 people or something have have um, commented and it's ridiculous It's not a great photo, you know, it's just me at 20 (laughs) and people want to connect. So I think, yeah, I think that's probably my, that really underlying premise for me is that I think every person wants to connect and every person uh, wants to be better on some level. I love that. And it's it's funny though, as an older adult, of which I am one. (laughs) Indeed, me too. (laughs) And I was just yesterday looking at some old um, photo albums from my Outward Bound days at, of me at in my 20s. And I'm looking at my colleagues, this, my friends as well from 20 years ago and thinking about that, you know, it's like, how have we changed? What is it about us in our 20s that captures an essence of who we are? And I think there's some nostalgia oriented around that, of course, um, that sort of everything is glowing 20 years ago. And I think there's also an element of we've got just this fresh-faced excitement about the future and we've got a few less 
filters or masks put on and it's you were kind of um, alluding to that you know it's like well we got a twitter handle now and that means and we're a particular role and responsibilities that means this this and this and we forget that there was at our core this fresh-faced excited person who's got the world ahead of them who wants to make a difference and have fun and has less of those masks um it's an interesting observation from a social worker in particular <laughs> yeah i should have been across it hey <laughs> <laughs> well I'm, yes and no yeah. you know well, you know, I'm human first. Yeah, that's right. I, I think, yeah, I, absolutely. Those photos, that's what it's done is really helped connect with people and their whole experience, not just, which I think I professionally, um, that's common practice for me, but I'd been a bit slack lately. You know, I hadn't been focused on that. I think too, optimism, that pu- purity of optimism and, um, you know, you were saying responsibility and things. And I thought, yeah, and I have more privilege now too. You know, more people trust me and more people are connected to me that gives me privilege that I have a responsibility about than I had back then. So it was a, yeah, smaller thing. And I like to think, I reckon half the people I know would say, yeah, they find that 20 year old in me all the time, you know, ridiculously <laughs> optimistic and, and uh, confident and, you know, kind of pretty, uh, what is it? I, you know, I'm not too, not too fast about rules and authority and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, although of course I abide by legal rules. Um, I, yeah, I think that that, that radicalness, I, I still, I still channel a fair bit of that. I think I'll take, you know, that's probably personality too. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, maybe it's a personality, spirit, whatever you want to call it. It's good. Do you think there's a difference in the way that people lead in the country as opposed to the way that people lead in the city? Are we always talking about rural city divide. Uh, hmm. Not really, because, uh, you know, i I haven't given it a lot of thought. So, uh, you know, off the top of my head, when I when I look at friends and colleagues, perhaps there's a little more reserve in the city, but I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it might be different, different areas of different areas of what influences people's connections and things. But um, I definitely, you know, I often hear people say the country is more conservative or the country is, you know, generalisations around being more conservative and less open to ideas. And I really would challenge that. I think that's totally, you know, that I can't swear, can I? It's uh, you know, <laughs> BS. <laughs> <laughs> it's, de- you know, it's definitely not true. I know amongst friends and colleagues that there's, and it's not, you know, just experience, you know, academically, we can prove, you know, every, every community and culture has different elements that influence how people appear to be conservative and things like that. But I, I just, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think we're all people and within our cultures, we have ways of being that make us more or less accessible to other people. But I don't think there's any difference between being in the city and being in the country. I like that's fascinating. And I would, you know, people in the country being more conserved, I think people in the country are, are incredible pioneers and experimenters and innovators, you know, because you have to be so, as I mentioned at the beginning, you have to be so resourceful with what you've got. And I think being a little bit more isolated in terms of access to infrastructure and so on incurs a sense of um, resourcefulness and creativity. So does that mean people lead differently? Maybe not. And I think your your points from the beginning about leadership is about connection and collaboration and, and a togetherness is a principle that applies in both city and country. So, Yeah, I, and that's because uh, I, I was thinking of my friends who I identify as leaders, you know, people who have formal high status roles in, in large corporations or companies and government and things. And I'm like, no, those are the same people. They're people who connect well with other people. They, you know, at their core, they value other people. So, yeah, I don't think that's, I think, yeah, culturally, obviously, there's lots of things that makes it look different. But, uh, and two of the the women that are coming to my mind, most rarely, both of them are city born and bred too. So, although I know them very well, they're not um, country people who've moved to the city or anything like that. They are definitely um, city born and bred. Yeah, right. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. So rural city divide. 
myth gone. <laughs> well, yeah, I think so. I, you know, I think it's a bit of a uh, it's a bit of a distraction from a lot of things. Uh, it's kind of I think too another one that I, I really challenge is that um, consumers. You know, we often hear consumers of primary produce, consumers of uh, um, agricultural product, desperately want to know where the provenance and welfare and and that there's a sense that welfare is not good enough in the country and things I, I don't think that's true at all I think there's a there are obviously some people who feel that way but I think that you know the proof's in the pudding the majority of people are going to the supermarket and buying products the way they did last time so uh, you know there there is a degree of connection between farmers and consumers that exists and I think it's very powerful and we haven't really tapped into that well uh, you know we've got lots of peak bodies who are doing lots of work to try and do that better but in a way sometimes I feel like we're coming at it from the point of view of the polarized minority rather than the majority which you know is the majority are wanting you know good value healthy clean green product and we're seeing that all around the world that's common in every every um, country all around the world so the consumer producer divide. I'm not sure if that's there either. No, I reckon there's a consumer curiosity about the producer because for those of us who haven't grown up on a farm or in the country, it's a bit of a mystery. When I started working in rural regional Australia in 2009, I was just gobsmacked at the kinds of the scale of operations and the intricacies of operations, no matter what people were producing from fiber to food, to the whole lot in agriculture, is that there's so much science and innovation and meticulousness and care that goes into producing what we eat and where. It was mind-blowing. And I think those, there's some extraordinary stories which are absolutely fascinating that, are, that need to be put out into the community so that people can have understanding of how interwoven we are with our folks who, who do do the production of food and fiber in this country. And I think COVID-19 is an awesome opportunity for that because it's agriculture is one of the essential services, you know, because we've got to be kept eating. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and yeah, don't get me wrong. I think there would be a lot of benefit in there being a greater um, knowledge base and, and connection between producers and consumers. I just mean, I don't think it's a big barrier to, to us as a, a civil society that sometimes it's it's reported as I think in the media I don't know what it's like in the city but you know what we see is is extreme you know protests and things about production and yet I know you know I live my life you know 99.9% of the time producing and working with producers who are selling it and it's being consumed and that's it it's not it's not a sensational story it's life and I, as you were saying that I was like oh and the intimacy between agricultural production and nature and how much work we put into that into getting it right into not mining natural resources not you know into replacing natural resources as we can and still produce in a productive and profitable way is it's phenomenal I mean the land care movement in the last 20 years has just revolutionized practice after practice after practice on farms and yeah it just it's not very sexy to know the difference between disking and no tilling but um you know it doesn't I have no idea what that is <laughs> so planting the seeds and okay. whether or not you you know dig up the soil completely and make it all crumbly and nice the way that you know we used to in the 50s or just dragging a, you know basically dragging a stick along and dropping a seed in and, you know, what we've discovered is dragging a stick along, dropping a seed in, um, you know, in most soil types, not all, but most soil types will be more beneficial to the environment because the soil will retain more carbon and more carbon will be sequestered because of the um, bioactivity under the soil if you don't disturb it. Things like that. But they're tiny little details that the current, you know, I think the current consumer who's, who's deciding whether to buy this steak or that steak isn't really mindful of because they've just had a big day at work driven home in, you know, half an hour of congested traffic. <laughs> you know, they're just thinking about other things. They're not thinking about the minutia of choices that go into their food production. I think it's more on a macro level. So what I've noticed in shops, even from my own shopping patterns, is making conscious choices in store. You know, is this an Australian-based product? 
And is it an independent grocer, an independent producer? And in which case I want to support that and not subscribe to the, the Woolies brand of everything so that there's diversity in the market of production. So I think there's in smaller choices on bigger principles, I think that's happening. But getting into the minutia of how is a pig raised and slaughtered and brought to market, I don't think there's a lot of knowledge or fascination around that per se. It's more about broadly, we want to know that things are good and clean and safe, as you said. Yeah. And we, and, and that's, we I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say, we in this context of the middle classes. So, you know, when I think about our agricultural production and the balances between, you know, the use of natural resource for the production of food and those sorts of things, I often get really quite caught up in what does this mean on a national scale what does it mean on a global scale and it's it's really there's a lot of practices that I can't you know just my personal knowledge I can't see them being globally significant without having a negative impact on people who have the least resources to purchase and control food so yeah we've got a lot of work to do I think globally around that and and Absolutely. More knowledge uh, and closer understanding and greater connection between people, you know, that's not going to go astray in shoring up our future. I think Australia has just really demonstrated time and time again that we have this incredible capacity with a low resource base that we're not depleting or, you know, we're depleting as you know, little as possible to be able to do that. So, you know, Hurrah, Australia. Hurrah, <laughs> <laughs> Australia, indeed. My last question for you is, uh, coming back to your personal leadership, is there a resource, a book, an idea, a quote that you turn to time and time again to help bolster confidence or conviction or give you focus? Uh, there's certainly, uh, you know, significant influencers, uh, people. Again, pretty corny. I think, uh, you know, my life might be a bit corny. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I know it is. Um, I, uh, you know, my dad, you know, and my dad and my mum, you know, growing up and what they achieved and, and how they did that is without a doubt my primary influence. You know, they, their practice and what they did put into place is more and more profound to me the older I get. Professionally, I think, uh, you know, I've just been really, really lucky to have amazing mentors uh, right from the get-go. So social workers uh, have part of our professional integrity is to have supervisors. Like that's a role that we describe that's very similar to mentor in the general field. And I've been really lucky to have mentor after mentor who's who's chosen to invest in me, which I'm very grateful. And I wouldn't like to mention any in particular because there's so many. And I, I think uh, in the last few years, Brene Brown, so since about 2010, there's a uh, American social worker, Brene Brown, who she's a Texan woman, and uh, I resisted reading Brene Brown for about 10 years because I <laughs> thought that she was another American guru psychiatrist and I'd had enough of them at that stage. Anyway, it turns out, no, she's a Texan woman who uh, did social work and I just feel a very, very strong connection to her because she talks about her conservative family lifestyle not really fitting with social work practice and the work that she had to do to reconcile that experience and value set. So going into social work in our uh, late teens in that transition from adolescence to adulthood, it's profoundly impactful on our values. And to move from a independence, individualistic value base of frontiersy, isolated people like you were describing before, that, you know, thing about country people that lots of people admire that, you know, you can, you know, get a stick and make a tyre out of it, you know, um, those <laughs> sorts of, uh, that, that, that uh, yeah, frontier type of personality to marry that with social justice and to marry that and um, reconcile it with um, the greater good for you know the common good the collective good is you know it was really hard work for me as a um, early adult and she Brené Brown has she studied shame 
and she's been able to describe how people connect and what stops them connecting in a way that I really relate to. And I think I mentioned words before that are, you know, that I hear and I go, oh, you know, that's that's coming from um, her, the way she describes things. So this armour that we have, that we protect ourselves from from deep connection. And what we can do to contribute to a better society by helping people to connect in a way that helps them move towards their goals is really, you know, I'd have to say probably she's encapsulated a lot of the academic learning I've had over the years. And I think Lane Care just, you know, I don't know how to thank the people who contribute to Lane Care. They're just the nicest people in the world. I can't believe I worked in an industry for 10 years where nobody <laughs> put anybody else down. I really, it is such a positive, optimistic, uh, reframe everything in a what's possible light. So yeah, just being a part of the land care community is something that's um, given me uh, a really strong foundation, knowing that every person has um, something that they want to do better. I love it. I love your optimism thread that's being pulled through through your mentors and your resources like Brene. Brene is a little bit of a hero of mine too. And I love the fact that in through all of it is coming back to how can we drop our masks? And I think exposing our 20-year-old selves more often <laughs> it might be a yeah. way to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Edwina, it's been fabulous. I've really enjoyed our conversation and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, sorry. It's been a delight. I love this conversation. It was wide ranging and profound. She is such a brilliant leader, has such a wonderful, optimistic and fun way of looking at things. Two things stand out from this interview for me. One is the leadership is not an I principle. I love this. And having a collectivist approach to leadership is, I think, essential in the future. Well, it's essential now, and I think it's especially essential into the future as we cannot solve the problems on our own. We all need each other to come to the fore, to collaborate, and to come up with solutions together. So I think that's, I love that. I think that was a brilliant insight from Edwina. And the second one is what she said here, pay attention to what they want, not what they should want. And I love that from a service-oriented, other person orientation, and that it's less about me and more about you. I think that's an invaluable lesson that I will carry with me. If you enjoyed this interview as much as I did, please share. Sharing is caring and you get good bonus karma points for doing so. Plus, you get to help spread the word and that's got to be good. All right. Thanks. And meantime, live well, lead well.